Well, this morning we are continuing a series that we began last week called Beyond Stuck. And we started off last time by looking at a video of where uh, some guys were stuck on an escalator. The escalator breaks down and they go, hey, there's nothing we can do about this, right? We're trapped. We can't get off the escalator. And we talked about sometimes we, we get the feeling like that as God's people in relationship to our spiritual growth. That sometimes we feel like, hey, maybe we just got stuck and we can't figure out what's, what's going on. Is there a way to move forward in our relationship with God? We talked a little bit about confession and, and what that does in our own spiritual lives and how it draws us near to God in that way. And this morning, we want to talk about obedience and what comes to mind when you hear the word obedience. All right? No fun allowed, right? I mean, this is not a popular word in our culture, is it? Most of the time, you go, man, I just... Uh, sometimes we, we just chafe at the idea of, of someone calling us to obedience. But we realize that obedience is actually part of the life of a disciple of Jesus. In fact, obedience or lordship is another way to talk about it, is, is, is central to what it means to follow Jesus. Because we, we, we talk about Jesus as our savior, that, that he is the one that redeemed us, that set us right with God. And that is true, and we don't ever want to forget that. But there's an aspect of following him that comes along with that. And sometimes we, we tell people about the love of God and, and to accept Jesus, and, and now your life is, is going to be different. But sometimes we forget to tell them that it's not just Jesus on top of your old life. It's not just now you just, the only thing different is you, you spend an hour in church on Sunday. You go, that, that's, not, that's not the life of a disciple. It's understanding that you are redeemed, you're forgiven by God, but now God wants to, to transform you. And he says, follow me. And we recognize that God is, he really is in a position of, of lordship, that, that it's not just like another name for Jesus, but it actually depicts a relationship that he actually has authority in our lives, that, that he, can, he speaks into our lives, and it's something that we follow. Um, and sometimes we go, you know, I'd like to treat this more like a democracy, right? And, um, and, and so as long as we agree on things, it works pretty good, right? But oftentimes, when we find our perspective looking a little different than God's, sometimes we'll choose to go another way. And there is a, a real struggle that comes in our life with obedience to God and what he's called us to do. Paul writes about this war. Sometimes the, the things that I do are the ones I don't want to do. And the other times the, the things that I want to do, those I don't do. Paul understands this. It's, it's the struggle of the Christian life, of the one who wants to walk with Jesus, who wants to have him lead and guide us. But oftentimes there's a struggle. There's also something else called selective obedience. <clears throat> you know about selective hearing, don't you? <clears throat> Some husbands have been accused of this before. And I think selective obedience has some parallels to this, right? And, and we might know what God's will is, but there, there, may, there may be a point at which we go, you know, God, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you in these areas, but in these areas, I, I, I don't know that I really want to do that. And, and I've got all kinds of reasons of, of why I can't do it. And, and God, you're God, so I know you understand me, right? Maybe not. And because you live in North America, I've got some pretty good ideas of the things that you struggle with because they're common in our culture. Some of these areas that we struggle with obedience to God often revolve around finances. Other times they revolve around our sexuality and the relationships that God has said, this is where it's appropriate, this is what I've made it for. Other times we get plagued with the things that we think are important, our priorities. And there's a host of other things that there are some things that we just want to hold on to. We know, God, I know you said, but. And we struggle with the aspect of obedience. 
Now, why is obedience important in the first place? I mean, what, what do you make of, of verses like this, right? Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. A very important verse for us. We don't ever want to skate too fast by that verse because this is foundational for our understanding of who we are in Jesus Christ. That there's not a thing that we could do to make ourselves acceptable to God it's what Jesus did on that cross. And we're saved by grace. But, and in fact, of all the verses in the Bible, right, the thousands of verses that are there, those two get a prominent place in our sanctuary, don't they? They're central to who we are. But then what do you do with a verse like that and then what Jesus said in our gospel lesson? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What do you do with those two verses? Because that second verse, it seems to say there's a, an obedience thing, doing the will of my Father, that somehow that's linked into what it means to know Jesus, to follow him, to receive or to walk in his ways. And people have wrestled with this in their walk. There are some who've just really just focused on the first verse and said, well, what really matters is just that I'm accepted by God and, and so I'm gonna kind of just run my life. I'm just gonna kind of do it my own way. And for, those are the ones we might call irreligious. I like grace, but I really don't want to hear about God's will. There are other people that say, well, I think that I got to make sure I do enough to be right with God. Religious people. And the belief there is that if, if, if I do the right things, I'll be accepted by God. It's the things I do that make me acceptable. And whether you're talking about an eightfold path in Buddhism, five pillars in Islam, the idea of karma that comes out of Hinduism. Every religion comes down to those same things. Am I doing the right things to be accepted by God or the spiritual force that's there? But Christianity actually says that can't be. That would never solve the problem. In fact, you already are accepted by Jesus. And it's out of this acceptance of who you are as a redeemed child of God that obedience springs forth. It's actually something we do out of love. I obey, therefore I'm accepted, is what religion says, versus the gospel. I'm accepted, therefore I obey. And friends, those that are on the outside of Christianity, they don't get this. They're gonna look at what you do and they're gonna think that you're trying to make yourself right with God. Because most people can't, can't get this. It makes no sense to them that I can't earn my salvation, I can't make myself right with God. But we say it's free, it's a grace. Another way of looking at this has to do with the motivation for obedience. The one who's a follower of, of a religion does it out of a sense of, of fear, oftentimes uncertainty, because what it, what it amounts to is, have I done enough? Have I done enough good to outweigh the bad? Have I done enough of these things so that God will accept me? But the follower of Jesus knows that really the reason that we do, we, we have obedience to God is out of joy for what he's already done. It's the way we say thank you for what you've done in our life, God. Thank you. Religion often says, I obey in order to get things from God. The, the idea being, all right, God, if, if I obey you really good this week and then I offer a prayer at the end, you're probably gonna be more likely to answer it the way I want, right? Do you think it works that way? Probably not. But sometimes obedience is almost a form of, of trying to get God to, to do the things that we want. 
But for the follower of Jesus that, that grasps the gospel, says, I obey God to get God. And what we mean by that is a relationship with him. We, it's not to get God's stuff, but it's actually for God himself. It's I do it out of a sense of, of what it does for the relationship we have. That it, it delights him, it helps, it lets us take on the, the shape of Jesus. We look more like him. Religion says, when circumstances in my life go wrong, I'm angry at God or myself, since I believe, like Job's friends, that anyone who is good deserves a comfortable life. But the gospel says, when circumstances in my life go wrong, I struggle, but I know all my punishment fell on Jesus, that while he may allow this for my training, he will exercise his fatherly love within my trial. What this means for us, beloved in Christ, is that God is not waiting up there to zap you when you mess up. He's not going, oh, oh, oh John, just wait. Let's see what's coming your way next, right? That he doesn't do that. And when you think about it, here's why. We believe that when Jesus was on that cross, that God laid the punishment for, him, uh, for every sin upon him. That every single sin that's been in the past, the present, the future, all of that was laid on Jesus. And he suffered for that. He was separated from God because of that. And what God has already laid on Jesus, a punishment for sin, he's not going to get you again for the same thing, is he? This is one of the things that we can live in comfort and confidence. Now, there is times where God disciplines, but that's another sermon, so we're not going there this morning. Religion says my identity and self-worth are based mainly on how hard I work or how moral I am. And so I must look down on those I perceive as lazy or immoral. I disdain and feel superior to the other. This is Phariseeism at its worst, friends. There's a, a bit of research out there of people that have walked away from church. And one of the most common reasons is that they feel that, that there are Christians that have looked down upon them without recognizing their own sin, but it comes across as, as judging them, as, as being better than another person. It's very different than calling a sin a sin. We always have to do that. But there's an attitude with which we do it. We stand on what God has said is right, but, but the first place we look when we talk about sin is here. It's here. And we recognize that we are just as much of need as God's grace as anybody else. The gospel says it this way. My identity and self-worth are centered on the one who died for his enemies, who was excluded from the city for me. And I'm saved by sheer grace, so I can't look down on those who believe or practice something different from me. It's only by grace that I am what I am. I have no inner need to win arguments. If you want to pursue this comparison between religion and the gospel, check out our blog later this afternoon. And I'm going to put up, there's a, uh, a sheet from one of Tim Keller's books that actually contrasts these things with about eight or ten different uh, ways that, the, that religion and the gospel contrast from each other. And it's fundamental for us to get this for, for the purposes of obedience. Because what can happen is there can be two of us sitting side by side in church together. And we might do the exact same outward thing, but the motivations are entirely different, right? I might do it because I'm afraid of God, or I might do it out of an obligation, or I might do it because I want people to look and see me looking good in front of other people. But that's gonna have a very different result from you who is sitting there saying, you know, I'm doing this simply because I love God. My motivation for this is, is to please him, to honor him, to draw near to him. And friends, those two actions will do a very different thing inside of you and in your spiritual life. One turns you into a Pharisee, the other draws you closer to God. Now sometimes obedience makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> right? In case of fire, exit the building before tweeting about it. That's a good idea, <laughs> right? We go, this, that, that makes sense to us. 
And sometimes we'll look at the Ten Commandments and you go, oh yeah, do not murder. That, that makes sense when we're living in a culture, right? It would be a very rough place to live if we didn't follow that commandment. And, and things like stealing and those, other, those are other commandments, we go, those make sense to me. Now, granted, we still struggle with them. We still will disobey them. But a lot of times we can go, at least I know why God is saying that. I get why he asked me to do that. But what happens when what God calls you to do doesn't make sense to you? What about then? And friends, this is a struggle for us because there's a why question, isn't there? God, I know that you've said that my sexuality is reserved for the bonds of marriage, but I don't understand why. It doesn't make sense to me. There's a host of other questions that we ask in our culture. And the question for the, how, how, we, how, we, how do we approach that as a people of God with those struggles? And I think maybe one of the best analogies for us is, is like that of a parent. That when, when you were three years old and your mom or dad said, all right, don't play by the curb, don't play near the street, Right? You might go, why? M- Mom, dad, you are so mean. You're trying to just to ruin all my fun. Right? I mean Because as a three-year-old, how, how, how much understanding are you going to have when they try to explain the bad things that could happen to you if you play near the edge of the road? You, you just don't get it. You don't understand. But someday you did. And someday, oh, that makes sense now, right? And, and remember when you were a teenager? And there were things that your parents said, and you're like, oh, they just do not get it, right? They are so out of it. They, they have no clue what they are talking about, why they're saying these things. But then as you got a little older and began to see some of the aspects of life that they had seen when they told you that, you go, oh, that makes sense. That was actually a really wise thing for them to say at that point in my life. And you find yourself even saying those same things to your teenagers, perhaps, now, if, if we can look at those things in our life and we go, yeah, I can see how there was a time where I didn't understand, but it was really a good thing to do anyway because there were other people that saw things that I couldn't see. Do you think it's possible that, that maybe the God who created the entire universe, who understands how it all works together and who has a, not just a perspective from this world, but a perspective on eternity, the God who sees and knows how it, how it all works together, as well as the God who said, I love you to the point that I'm going to send my son to die for you so that we can have an eternal relationship. Do you think it's possible that God may ask you to do things that you don't understand, but it's for your own good? Do you think it's at least possible? I do. There's an aspect of obedience to what God calls us to do, of following him even when we don't understand, even when it doesn't make sense to us, especially when we don't feel like it. My heart feels like this, but God's heart says something different. What do we do? Who do we follow in those circumstances? One of the things that happens when you say, God, out of, out of a knowledge of who you are, out of a desire to please you, out of a desire to love you, I'm going to do what you ask, even when I don't understand it. Friends, it does great things for your spiritual life because you are trusting God. You're saying, God, I, I'm gonna, I accept this. Because of your record in the past and the things I do understand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you even when I don't understand. It draws us near to God when we obey But there's another great thing that happens in obedience. In fact, this is the way that we express love back to God. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. Right? We understand we're already accepted by God. We are already loved by him. This comes as our our response back to God. Remember when Jesus said the greatest command was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Like, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. But what does that actually look like? 
I mean, what, what happens when you actually try to apply that and, and, and figure out how, how do we actually love God in that way? How do you express the love to God? And friends, sooner or later, it has to come back to obedience. Obedience not to make us right with God, not to make God accept you any more than he already has. But he can't. But simply what it is, it's, it's the way you say, God, I love you. I appreciate you. I, I am so grateful for what you've done in my life. And, and this is the way that I know how to say thank you. That I'll even, I'll deny myself and I'll go your way. And even when I struggle, and even when I don't feel like it, God, I do this because of who you are. The desire to have a deeper relationship with you, a desire to praise you, to honor you. And friends, that's, that's what God's called us to do. It's who he's called us to be. He's called us to be people who kneel at the foot of the cross, who say, you are the Lord. You do have authority in my life. And Father, I, I submit to you. I want to obey you. I not only want the grace, but I want the, the transformation. I want you to change me. I want you to make me more and more like your son, Jesus. What it comes down to, friends, is there's probably an error in your life where you're not being obedient to God's will. And think just for a second what that might be. Is it in the area of finances? Sexuality, priorities, something else. I want to challenge you. Whatever it is that God has laid on your heart just now, to make a step forward. To say, Father, I know I'm accepted. I know that whether or not I change this, you still love me. But to honor you, to draw near to you, I want to say no to myself and yes to you. And friends, do that. Try it even just for 30 days and see if God does not bring more joy into your life from following him. Because there's a God who loves you more than you love yourself. A God who wants the very best for you. Not just now, but for eternity. And he calls you to obedience, to follow him in every aspect of your life. I'd like to pray for you about obedience, especially that one issue in your life. Father, there are a number of things in our lives that are out of alignment with your will. But Father, what we want more than anything else is you. And we thank you that we stand accepted before you, before you've ever changed anything about us, before you've ever transformed us, that we are loved, that we are forgiven. But Lord, we want more than that. We want to be transformed. We want to bear the image of your son. And Father, there are areas in our lives that are not aligned with you. And Father, you know what they are. And Father, we would like you to change us. We would like to surrender those areas to you. And Father, as that happens, Lord, we pray, Lord, that we would honor you in that and that you would draw us nearer to you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace, amen. Stand together as we sing, I will follow.